Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very excited to share that I recently launched 365 Days with Medieval and Renaissance Wonder Women. This immersive learning experience is much more than just an online course. Over 12 months in 2025, participants will come together and contribute to a supportive and inspiring online community of individuals who'll share in a unique learning experience, one that will ultimately deepen their understanding of the lives and experiences of medieval and Renaissance women. Together, we'll explore the contributions made by a variety of European women and celebrate, among other qualities, their courage, creativity, resourcefulness and resilience. I will guide participants every step of the way, but I'll also be joined by a stellar list of 28 contributors, including the brilliant broadcaster, best-selling author and Oxford academic, Professor Yanina Ramirez, who'll deliver the opening address. Head to my website, onthetudortrail.com, for further details, including a full list of sessions and presenters and testimonials from current participants. I do hope you'll consider joining me on this unique learning experience. I'd also, of course, like to acknowledge and thank the generous listeners who continue to support Talking Tudors on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors Patreon family. Please visit patreon.com slash Talking Tudors for more information. When you join the Patreon community, you'll instantly unlock access to exclusive posts. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and take part in a member-only book club. They can also enter patron-only monthly giveaways to name but a few of the perks. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm excited to welcome Sharon Bennett Connolly to the podcast to talk about her forthcoming book, Heroines of the Tudor World. Sharon is the best selling author of several non fiction history books. A fellow of the Royal Historical Society, Sharon has studied history academically and just for fun, and has even worked as a tour guide at a castle. She also writes the popular history blog, HistoryTheInterestingBits.com and co-hosts the podcast A Slice of Medieval, alongside historical novelist Derek Burks. Sharon regularly gives talks on women's history for historical groups, festivals, and in schools. She's a feature writer for All About History and Living Medieval magazines, and her TV work includes Australian television's Who Do You Think You Are? Let's dive straight into our conversation. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Sharon. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Natalie. Thanks for having me on. Yes, I've been looking forward to our conversation. So perhaps a good place to start is you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about you and your background. Well, my name's Sharon Bennett Connolly. I am now a historian and an author, but I haven't always been. I used to work at Euro Disney in Paris and after that Euro Star in London. So I'm bilingual or oh was when I was using my French all the time. Now it's a little, I can read great, but speaking French is a bit dodgy every now and then. I have always been interested in history. I think I worked out during an interview a while ago that it was um, when I was about six or seven in primary school, we had a visit from a museum with um, clothes, you know, different 
historical clothes. And the one the item I remember is Queen Victoria's bloomers. <laughs> one of my friends got to wear Queen, Victor- Queen Victoria's bloomers. And it was only while I was doing this history podcast a couple of months ago that I realised probably weren't Queen Victoria's <laughs> bloomers because we were only six and she was a big woman. So I'm not sure Nicola would have been able to wear them even if she'd put a rope around her waist. I think it's from that point onwards that I got a real interest in history and just absorbed everything about it ever since. You know, I got a book when I was about nine, Kings and Queens of Britain. I still read it and it's the most dog-eared book I've got now because it has gone everywhere with me. When I lived in Paris for six months, the book went with me. And when I went to university, it was the first thing I packed. So I've just always had this love of history. And in 2014, my husband didn't know what to buy me for Christmas. So he bought me a blog and I started writing historic article, historical articles, mainly about the women because they were the articles that got the most attention. And I did notice on Facebook, there are thousands of groups about the kings in history, but very few groups about the women. So I started a group called Medieval Queens and Heroines, and um, it basically took off from there. I started writing and I haven't stopped. Yes, and we are actually here to talk about one of your books. So Heroines of the Tudor World, which is forthcoming, I think. That's not published yet, is it? No, it's out in June in the UK. Um, I don't know when it's out in the rest of the world yet. They haven't set a date, but probably about six months later, hopefully before Christmas. So tell us a little bit about it. What inspired this particular project? Well, this project actually comes from my first book. I wrote my first book was Heroines of the Medieval World. And I wrote that as I entered a competition with Amberley Publishers for to get my your first book published. And I sent in this proposal for Heroines of the Tudor World to look at the different types of women and how they achieved fame, fortune or infamy. And I didn't win. I got an email back saying, Karen, you entered this competition. I'm sorry, you haven't won. However, we would like to publish your book anyway, which they did. And it is still selling well. And it was from that I thought, you know, I could write a sequel, Heroines of the Tudor World. And I emailed my editor, uh, Sean, and said, I'm thinking about this book. And he said, oh, yes, please. So um, that's how it's come about. It's like it's my first ever sequel. How wonderful. And and given that, of course, there are so many fascinating Tudor women, how did you go about selecting the women that you included in this book? Oh, it was so hard. Because like you say, there are so many. In Heroines of the Medieval World, I had 600 years worth of women I covered. In Heroines of the Tudor World, I thought, oh, it'd be so easy because there's only 117 years to cover, you know, it's be fine. But there is so much more information out there for Tudor people than there is for the medieval. And I found that I have written about fewer women because I've got so much more information so I can go deeper into their stories. I did want to include Henry VIII's queens. You can't exactly write a book about the Tudors without it, but I didn't want them to be the focus of the book. So they are in there, but they're part of other people's stories rather than their own stories or a part of their story that is less well known. It was really difficult to pick and choose who to put in but it was mainly some of them are ones I've always been interested in like I live on the borders with Lincolnshire so I put a few Lincolnshire women in like Anne Askew, Catherine Willoughby the Duchess of Suffolk who lived down in Grimsthorpe Castle in South Lincolnshire which is gorgeous I actually visited it during writing the book and got some photos and things and it's brilliant to be able to be in the buildings that these people lived in And there were some women that I couldn't not put in, like Bess of Hardwick, who a lot of people have heard of, but not everybody's heard of. And she was just an incredible survivor and a very astute businesswoman. I tried to put in as much variety as possible, but I kept the chapters based on the chapters for heroines of the medieval world. So which made it easier because I knew where I was going. I knew what kind of women I wanted in each chapter. Which when I wrote Heroines of the Medieval World, it was like, what chapters do I use? How do I do this? With this one, it's like, I've actually already got the framework. So I didn't have to worry about that bit. It was just getting the women who I could include in it. So you talked about the fact that there's obviously quite a lot of material for some of these Tudor women. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about your research process and and what that involved? There is quite a lot of information. One of my favourite books I got was um, Anne Crawford's Letter to the Queens of England which had letters in it from every single one of Henry VIII's queens, Elizabeth of York, 
which was great because you actually read the words of the women themselves. But also that everything is online these days. You must have noticed that because you're so far away from yeah. being able to visit the National Archives. But there's so much that you can just, archive.org is a godsend because all the chronicles are on there. And if they're not on there, they're on the Hathi Trust. So you you can really get into like Edward Hall's chronicle and also the letters and papers of Henry VIII. A lot of those are on British History Online. So it did actually, researching these days is a heck of a lot easier because you do it from your computer rather than having to visit archives and things. Although I did um, I did have a trip to the Lincolnshire archives because there's a few things in there. It, it takes a bit of searching because you don't always find the um, chronicles in English. I had this problem with my medieval books because a lot of the chronicles are in Latin and um, my Latin is incredibly non-existent. So sometimes I have to look for them in French, whether if they haven't been translated into English, then at least if they've been translated into French, I can read them. But yeah, it's mainly, it's brilliant that it's mainly online, although I do visit places as well, because I think going like Hardwick Hall and um, Gainsborough Old Hall, it's nice to just visit places like that to get a feel for the history and remember what you're writing about and that these people lived in these buildings. So with your book, Sharon, you begin by looking at Tudor ideas of what made an ideal woman in the Tudor eyes. So tell us a little bit about these ideas. Well, I was surprised to discover that the Tudor, Tudor ideal was very similar to the medieval ideal of a woman. And we have to remember that these ideals are not set by the women. You know, they're set by men and society and and the church. And the woman is supposed to be an obedient girl to her father, grow up, marry the person her father decides she marries and have children. And as we see from Henry VIII, the idea of having a son is one of the most important parts of marriage. And I mean, you look at Elizabeth of York, I think is my first in the Tudor ideal, and she just epitomizes what the image of womanhood was throughout Tudor times, because she literally gave her life trying to give her husband another son and the same with Jane Seymour and you just look at these women that is the ideal but they don't always reach it and of course women we are a fickle bunch we like to spread our wings and do what we want to do as well so while men might have this ideal there aren't that many women who reach it yes and it was quite dangerous when you didn't reach it for some women as well it was you look at um I mean the one of my other ideals in there is Jane Seymour who of course did give her life to give Henry VIII a son the irony being that it was Henry VIII's daughter Elizabeth I who became the greatest monarch in the era but yeah it was interesting to see that very little had changed from medieval times to Tudor times about the view of women and that educating women was still frowned upon. And although there were some things like girls could become apprentices more easily in Tudor times than they had before that. And there was a time when women were allowed to talk about religion to other women, especially noble women. There was a time during Henry VIII's reign when noble women were allowed to talk to teach other women about religion. But then the laws changed and they weren't. And it must have been really hard for women you look at it in Afghanistan now, where they've had freedom to do certain things, and suddenly that freedom's curtailed because of the religious changes. So it must have been quite hard for women to toe the line. And so do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the lesser known women that you feature in your book? Well, I think the least well-known woman is one I found out about from a visit to the Royal Armouries in Leeds. There were people demonstrating swordplay. And one of them was a woman and she mentioned a woman in Tudor times. So I had a word with her afterwards. And there's this lady named Margaret Barnes or Long Meg, who was an expert swordsman and ran a pub in London and um, was always the one, if anyone needed kicking out, she was the one who did it. <laughs> so she's the least well known. I couldn't find an awful lot of information about her, but I was like, she's definitely going in my warrior heroine story, simply because she was brilliant. I always have a chapter on literary heroines. And of course, you've got people like Margaret Roper, Catherine Parr, Catherine Parr who um, published her own book. But then I discovered a lady called Margaret Hobie, who was towards the end of the Elizabethan era. And she kept a diary 
And it was at that time that hers was probably the first. So you see it carried on into the Stuart era where um, women started keeping diaries. They're not very personal, to be fair. You know, she's talking about when she went to church and what sheep need shearing and things like that. But it's interesting that women have started writing down about their daily lives. And it was illuminating because it was something that you haven't seen before. Julian of Norwich in medieval times were personal reflections on their religious experiences. But this was like, yes, she was talking about her church life, but she was also talking about her daily life. And it's just interesting to see a bit more of the mundane. And from somebody who was just, she was a Yorkshire landholder, you know, she wasn't somebody who was royal or famous. She was just a lady who thought, I'm going to write this down. Yes, and in case our listeners are interested, you can actually read an edited version of her diary, which I have dipped into several times. And and it is, as you say, quite mundane in places, but still fascinating just to see what their daily life was like. I got it from Amazon and I was like, I was amazed. I'd I'd never heard of it until I started looking into writing this book. I'd never heard of her or that she'd written this diary. But And then when I started looking for it, it's like, oh my God, it's available on Amazon. Right, I'm having that. Yes. (laughs) And I think I was not shocked, but I was quite surprised by just how many hours were taken up by some sort of religious activity. Of course, I knew, you know, that people were very pious and religious in the time, but, you know, so much of her day was either teaching someone, listening to a sermon, reading the Bible, praying. It was it was quite yeah. quite amazing, really. It is. And I think that still harks back to medieval times when they had the officers of the day yes. and the religious officers of the day, and they were still carrying that on into Tudor times. I think now it's very difficult for us to understand because unless you live and work in a cathedral, you don't see it. But in those days, their clock was based on the next religious service or observance. Yeah, it was interesting. First thing she does in the morning is get up and pray and before dinner, go and pray. And <laughs> but then, then see to somebody who's talking to her about the sheep or the land. Or, yeah. But yeah, it was interesting to see how a lady ran her life, you know, and how she organised her days. Absolutely. And so one of the chapters that you cover is called Scandalous Heroines. So do you want to introduce us to some of these colourful women? Yeah, well, when I wrote the book, the first book, um, The Heroines of the Medieval World, I wanted to include people like Catherine Swinford. And Catherine Swinford was, she was quite scandalous in her day and and a mistress of John of Gaunt. So I have got two chapters. Unfortunately, there were so many mistresses and scandalous women that I couldn't put them all in one chapter in Heroines of the Medieval World. So I ended up with two chapters, mistresses and scandalous heroines. And um, scandalous is quite an extension of mistresses at times. But... Who do I put in this? Mistresses got taken up a lot by Anne and Mary Boleyn. So it was like, well, in Scandalous Heroines then, I can include Diane de Poitiers, who was the mistress of Henry II. And she was like his second wife. You have to feel for Catherine de Medici. She she was married to Henry II, but it was Diane de Poitiers who he adored. He and Catherine de Medici were having real trouble in the bedroom. So she used, Diane de Poitiers used to warm him up and get him excited and then send him to Catherine to finish the job. And it's like, oh my God, you couldn't make this up. There's uh, Jane Boleyn and Catherine Howard are in there. A lot of the time with the book, instead of focusing on the queens, Henry's queens, I tell somebody else's story that includes Henry's queens. So Jane Boleyn, who was Anne Boleyn's sister-in-law, was executed alongside Catherine Howard because of Catherine's indiscretions. So I've told Jane and Catherine's story together. And um, that was interesting because you look at Catherine Howard, she was so young. And Jane Boleyn was just, she had lost her husband. She'd been part of Anne Boleyn's family and part of the royal court as the sister-in-law of the Queen. And then she lost her sister-in-law and her husband. And managed to escape the downfall of the villains, only to be dragged into Catherine Howard's indiscretions, and probably quite willingly as well by the look of it. And you just think maybe she just was looking for somebody else to have love and happiness. And it just all ended drastically. You know, there, there is this suggestion that she was mentally ill by the time she was executed. And I'm thinking she there was probably something wrong with her because 
encouraging Catherine Howard to have an affair with Thomas Culpepper was not a sensible thing to do. And it was bound to end in disaster. So I think she had a self-destruction streak in her somewhere. Obviously, you spent a lot of time reading about these these remarkable women. So what are the, some of the things that they achieved in the 16th century that stand out to you? Well, some of them achieved things that they probably never wanted to achieve. Like I read um, Anne Askew's story is yeah. incredible. This woman from Lincolnshire who she was abused by her husband, joined the Reformed faith, was told off for reading the Bible in Lincoln Cathedral went to London to try and get a divorce from her husband and joined the circle of the evangelists in London. And she gets arrested. She gets found guilty and sentenced to death. And then she gets tortured in the Tower of London. She's the only, she's one of only two women to have ever been tortured in the Tower of London because the chaps torturing her wanted to find out if Catherine the Queen, Henry VIII's Queen at the time, was involved. And she was an incredibly brave woman. If Catherine Parr was involved, she didn't give her up. She didn't give up the names of anyone, of Catherine Willoughby either, who they questioned her about. So it's an incredible brave woman. And she had to be carried to her execution on a chair. She was burned at the stake. Well, she'd had all her limbs, shoulders and hips had been dislocated because of being racked. So she had to be carried to her execution on a chair. I mean, that is an extreme one. There are others who are um, fascinating stories. Serena Sforza, she's a good one. She was, um, she's in my warrior heroines. And um, she helped me back to William Marshall because there's a point where Cesare Borgia is besieging her at her castle and he's got her children. And he says he's going to kill them. And she lifts her skirt and says, it's all right, I've got the, I've got the uh, machinery to make more. And it's like when William Marshall was captured by King Stephen and Stephen threatened to execute him. He was only a boy of six at the time. Uh, John Marshall, his dad turned around and said, it's all right, I've got the hammers, hammer and anvils to make more. The love stories I was really surprised at. I knew that in my true love chapter, it was going to be Mary Tudor and Charles Brandon. Because Mary had been married to Louis XII of France, who was an ageing king. Although that got me, because he died when he was 53, and that's how old I am. And I don't consider myself as ageing. So I don't think he was as elderly a king as they say he was. But there's also Madeleine of France, who, she was the daughter of Francis I. And um, James V of Scotland wanted to marry her. And Francis refused because she had um, probably tuberculosis. She was ill most of her life. But she want, so wanted to marry James V. Um, she persuaded her dad to let her. In. He went over to France to meet her and marry her. And they spent a few months in France travelling around with the French court, which was lovely and perfect. And it sounds like a, a wonderful honeymoon. And then they go back to Scotland. And, of course, the Scottish climate is damp and cold. And within about six weeks of her arriving in Scotland, she died. And everybody knew that that was what was going to happen. She was so desperate to marry James V. She was happy to risk her life to do it. Or maybe she knew she was going to have a short life. She knew she was ill and she thought she'd get as much happiness as she could before she died. But it's just such a tragic story. You just feel for the poor girl. Yes, that is. That's a heartbreaking story, that one. So, Sharon, were there any women that you really wanted to include, but you weren't able to for either lack of sources or not enough space? It was not enough space, definitely. <laughs> I wasn't, I didn't realise how much information I could get on each of the women. So, where in some chapters, there's only three women. There's no more than five women in each chapter because there's so much information. But there were others I had hoped to include, but I was just getting tight on space, so I thought I'd better leave them out. And um, the main ones was Lucrezia Borgia and Arbella Stewart. And I decided I would leave them out in the end because they do have biographies of their own out there. So at least people can look them up elsewhere. The one I regret, really regret leaving out is Vittoria Colonna, who was a poet. And I would have loved to have put her in the literary heroines book. I was always going to put Marguerite Dongolem in there because her writings are very famous and even Elizabeth I used to translate them. 
So I thought I've got to put her in there. And then I discovered Margaret Hobie and thought, I really need to put this diarist in there. And so there wasn't room for Victoria Colonna, uh, which I do regret. But maybe I'll do a Heroines of the Tudor World too and put everyone else in. Yes, exactly. Why not? <laughs> and so... More Heroines of the Tudor World. There were so true. many. Having done medieval, mostly medieval, it was a surprise how liberating it is to have so much information on women but how annoying it is because then you just write so much more. Exactly. And are you working on any new projects at the moment? I have just finished writing Scotland's Medieval Queens, which will be out in January. I'm really proud of that one. I am I think I've done a good job on that one. That one definitely exceeded its word limit. It was supposed to be 95,000 words and it was 130,000. <laughs> I have done a thorough job of every medieval queen from St Margaret to Margaret of Denmark. So hopefully my editing won't be too mean with the, with the cuts. Oh, well, that and I'm working wonderful. at the minute on the medieval princess from William the Conqueror to the Wars of the Roses. So um, looking at the fates of the English princesses and their lives and what they got up to. So I'm enjoying that. I've literally just started that one. So I'm just looking at William the Conqueror's daughters at the minute. Wow, you are immersed in women's history, aren't you? It's amazing. <laughs> I am. I found I found my niche. Yeah, and it's ever wonderful. so funny because when I was at university, it was very much military history I was interested in. My dissertation was on the soldiers of the Peninsula War of Wellington's army. So I've come late to women's history. Because I used to think that there was nothing, you know, that they all they did was sit at home sewing and raising children. How wrong I was. I think it's good to see there are so many authors now, historians, turning to looking at women's history, yourself included. And it's brilliant that we're bringing them into the limelight. I did get accused once of changing history because I'm writing about these women and they didn't really do all that much. And it's like, well, they did. And I'm not changing history. I like to look at it as putting history back together you know exactly. you include the women's history then you're making history whole before now we've only looked at the men's history and even elizabeth the first is judged on how she acted how much she acted like a man and she knew it and she said it herself didn't she i may have the weak and feeble body of a woman but the heart and mind of a king and a king of england too you know she knew that she had to act like a man to to be accepted and it's just nice to actually look at her now in the as a woman and say look she achieved this she was a woman and this is what we've all been capable of bring them into the limelight and show that they were a part of history just as much as the men were and I think that's important for girls especially in schools you know they're doing history they should see themselves in the history in the story yeah completely and agree with you yeah it's just it's just a shame it's taken this long for people to realise it, but it's nice to see people are realising it and are turning to look at what about the women. Now, Sharon, the last thing I do on Talking Tutors when I have guests on for the first time is what I call a game of 10 to go. So these are just 10 quick questions just to get to know you a little bit better. So the first one is, what is a favourite historic site that you like to visit? Lincoln Castle. Oh, actually, and Lincoln Cathedral. Lincoln Cathedral is just... Dunning. And it's right next to the Bishop's Palace, which is where Henry VIII and Catherine um, Howard stayed during their um, Northern Progress. Um, but Lincoln Cathedral is just stunning. You, I did pro, an episode of Australia's Who Do You Think You Are with Jennifer Byrne, and we did a, we recorded it in the Lincoln Cathedral Wren Library at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning. So I walked into the cathedral through the nave, eight o'clock on a Sunday morning, there was absolutely nobody around. But there was choir music on. And it was just such, you know, you walk into somewhere and you just get this experience, this yeah. total surrounded by history and nobody there to make it look modern or anything. It was just, I was there in the past. And it's just an incredible feeling. Well, that sounds absolutely perfect. What about the last book that you either purchased or that you read? Last book I purchased was Nicholas Orme's Going to Church in Medieval England. Ah. And a new skill or a hobby that you might like to learn? Proper calligraphy. I'd love to be able to do, I can do it right in italics, but I'd love to be able to do calligraphy properly. And you're obviously a very busy writing lots of lots of wonderful books. So what do you like to do to relax and unwind a little bit? 
read. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love to read. I love to read history and historical fiction. I'll go for a walk with yes. um, my son. He's 18 and at university now studying military history. And we go for a walk and just talk history. And but we talk his what he's interested in. Right. Okay. <laughs> so we get a bit more diverse history to medieval. Although his favourite lecturer at the minute is um, his medieval lecturer. Because of the first day of term, he walked in with shields and axes and had them do a shield wall. So he's his favourite lecturer. Well, that sounds really good. That sounds like an engaging lesson. <laughs> and what about the last film or perhaps series that you watched? That one is really easy. We sat on Saturday night with the popcorn watching Gunpowder, oh. all three episodes, so three hours. Um, just sat watching it and, um, yeah, that was well worth it. I'd seen it when it was on telly originally, but I haven't seen it in ages. And my son's actually studying the Stuarts in one of his modules. So I said, oh, gunpowder, do you want to watch it? And we just sat and watched the whole three hours from start to finish. And it was well worth it. And what about um, something that you might have on your bucket list that you'd like to achieve? I would love to go to St. Petersburg in Russia and see the Winter Palace. I had a few things. When I was a teenager, there were three things on my bucket list. There was Versailles, the Battlefield of Waterloo, and St. Petersburg. And St. Petersburg's the only one I haven't done. So I'd like to do that. Apart from sort of medieval and Tudor history, are there other periods of history that you're interested in? The Napoleonic. As I said, when I did my dissertation, I, it was on the um, soldiers of Wellington's army. And I'm just, I'm a big Bernard Cornwell fan. And I got into it reading the sharp books when I was a teenager and I've read everything of his since. So that's what got me into the Peninsula War and it's still one of my favourite periods. Lovely. And what does an ideal Sunday morning look like for you? My ideal Sunday morning is getting up and me and my husband go out for a coffee and a croissant, just the two of us. Um, we do that every Sunday morning now. It, we, it just happened one thing. It's like, let's carry on doing this because this is lovely. Just spending a little time having a coffee and a croissant and just having a natter. Yeah, that sounds really and lovely. And then I get back and do the ironing, which oh. isn't ideal, but <laughs> it got to be done. <laughs> exactly. It's one of those things that just never goes away. Um, mm. and, and last question, you've obviously, you know, a lot of women from history. Is there any one particular woman that that really inspires you or that stands out for you? In my med in medieval, it's Nicola de la Haye, who held Lincoln Castle against practically everybody. She was besieged there a number of times and she was she's undefeated, which is not many things, <laughs> not many men can claim that. And she was the first ever female sheriff in England. So for medieval, it would be her. For Tudor, it would have to be Elizabeth I. I would just love to meet her. That would be quite a moment, wouldn't it? Incredible. Mm -hmm. And the very last thing, exactly. Sharon, the very last thing is the Tudor takeaway. So I ask all my guests for a takeaway, something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode. So do you have a takeaway for us? Well, mine would be to visit somewhere like Gainsborough Old Hall. I live over the river from it. And I know you've been there because I've yes. read your book. on it. Lovely. <laughs> and I, it is, Gainsborough's changed actually since you were there as well. It's... Um, there's a lot more new buildings in the, in the area. It's a lot of lot less fewer derelict buildings, but it's just stunning. This medieval manor house in the middle of just an English old English market town. You know, there's nothing. It's not like it's Hampton Court Palace and it's next to London. It's just in this market town, and it's just a stunning manor house. And they brought it back from. It was a wreck at one stage. You could see through the walls from one side to the other but now it's just incredible and they've got the the medieval kitchens are still all intact and until recently they used to have the fires on in the kitchens and that was the best I would go there when they said they had the fire going in the kitchen I would go and just just to see it working it's incredible it's just a beautiful building and I always get a sense of history there because Catherine Parr lived there for a short time with her first husband and um, Rose Hickman, who is in my re religious heroines chapter, lived there at the end of the Tudor period. It looks like it would have done then, except for the surrounding houses are there now where they would, it would have been a park. You don't have to imagine what it was like in Tudor times. You can just look at it and see it. So that would be my takeaway, something like that. Not necessarily Gainsborough's Hall, but 
if you can and if you can't visit go online and have a look do these online tours just to give you a sense of what these buildings were like in Tudor times well that's a great takeaway it has been a long time since I visited Gainsborough actually so I'll need to pop that one on my list too so many places to visit amazing Sharon thank you so much for taking the time to talk Tudors with us oh it's been my pleasure thank you for asking me Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.